but let's just wait until we have done all the 12 pings. I think that's 13, isn't it? Colleagues, welcome to this meeting of um, Employment Committee of Portsmouth City Council. Um, I'm Giles Ann Jackson, leader of the council, and I chair this committee. If we quickly just run round and introduce ourselves, Simon. I'm Councillor Simon Bosher. Councillor Lewis Gosling. Councillor Darren Sanders. <laughs> Councillor Cal Corkery. Natasha Edmonds, Director of Corporate Services. Peter Bart, Assistant Director of HR. And Councillor Jeanette Smith. James Harris, Senior Local Democracy Officer. Last but by no means least, Andy. Uh, Andy Biddle, Director of Adult Social Care. Hello, ah, um, the late Mr Locke. Apologies, Leader. Uh, Richard Locke, Council Procurement Manager. Lovely to see you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. Um, colleagues, usual um, housekeeping things. If there's a fire alarm, it's real. Um, and we meet at the Turning Circle in St King Henry Street and try not to get run over. Um, and please do, if you've signed in to be here, sign out with the people from the Guild Hall. Um, there are, we've, we've been through all the stuff about COVID to make sure that people are... Uh, are protected and um, I see a very interesting report today at Gold that says actually the thing that's really important is the social distancing stuff about um, keeping the outbreak down um, and it's and it is hugely effective um, so we're going to try to get that report circulated to everybody um, then uh, live web streaming um, uh, it's, it's live web. I don't think we've got any members of the public here to worry about, um, nor have we got deputations from people, so um, it'll be live streamed in the normal way. Okay, um, colleagues, no apologies for absence, we're all here. Um, declarations of interest. Um, Cal? Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a personal interest in probably every um, agenda item and then I'm a member of and employed by a trade union. Okay, thanks very much indeed about that. Carol, Jeanette? Yeah, um, just to um, my normal one, which is I'm a paid official of um, Hampshire Branch Unison. That, thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of September. Um, Corey, can I record my thanks to the people who did the um, employment um, subcommittee to, for um, looking at the appointment of a new director of children's uh, services. Um, I know it's a, a grueling day, um, but um, thank you very much indeed to everybody who, who did that and, um, and for the outcome of that. Um, Natasha, I'm the, and I don't know what colleagues think, I'm, it, it seems to me assistant directors have a very have, are very senior posts within this organisation now, uh, and I wonder whether we should ask for a paper because we're only involved as members in the appointment of directors, not in assistant directors, and I'm wondering whether we should ask for a paper to look at whether we, sh as members, should be involved in the appointment of assistant directors, be just because they are so so powerful. Now I don't know what colleagues think. We haven't talked about this, Red, really. Any views? Um, I would I would support that, Gerald. And I think it's important to get as much member involvement as possible. Um, so well, I think that's a very good thing. I'm not sure we can have member involvement in terms of appointing every year. So no, I really understand. Um, I, I, I think mean, otherwise we spend our entire it's, it's, life it's, it's, doing it is helpful doing interviews. Um, what do other people think? Do you th would that be a useful paper to have? Uh, sorry, Jeanette. My apologies. Yes, yeah, all right. Um, I wouldn't be in favour of that, um, mainly because um, we have um, HR services who are a professional sort of body, so they um, can sort of manage the assistant directors, um, and normally you have a director on that panel as well, so um, I'm not sure what value there is of member involvement on that, because um, obviously the director will know 
what sort of skill set they actually want. So um, I just think it would be um, member interference for no reason. Cal? Thank you. Um, I think it's worth looking at, so I'll be open to the idea of a paper being bought. What I would be particularly interested in is what is best practice elsewhere. So, I mean, if it's standards that in other local authorities happens, then okay. If we would be an outlier, then maybe it's a, a different decision to be taken. Okay. Um, Simon? I'm not adverse to having a, a paper come to Employment Committee on it, but uh, I, I'm largely with <laughs> Jeanette, uh, with regards to member involvement in it, <clears throat> some of these roles are extraordinarily technical and if I can perhaps just single out one assistant director that I deal with on a regular basis and that's in traffic and transportation, um, she is an excellent officer but I don't know what value I would add to employing her with <laughs> The, uh, the skill set that is required to go with such a technical post and I would suspect that probably goes for any member of the City Council. So do we want a paper to look at the options or not? If it ain't fixed, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's my view. I, I don't see any merit, but it might be interesting that Natasha has been sitting there with her finger hovered over the microphone. It might be worth having a, a view of a director, to be quite honest. Natasha? Uh, more than happy to bring a paper to the committee for consideration. Um, what I would say is uh, they are quite often uh, assistant directors are very technical roles requiring quite specialist qualifications um, and I think what would be useful would be to outline in a paper exactly what the committee have requested in terms of where there is a specialism, what is practice in other local authorities, what's considered best practice for the committee to then consider. Okay, so I, I, I think a paper without for, for information for without, pre, without predetermining any outcome would be interesting. Uh, I'm, so I know Andy is here, and you you are qualified in the in the in the area you do uh, in the same way as Peter Bolf is qualified in the area he does. And yet, when we appoint Peter Bolf, we're not involved in that. But when we well, okay. So he's an assistant director. He's um, as the city solicitor and monitoring officer. We're involved in him. Okay. You are involved as a statutory post. Okay. But as somebody, the head of IT, when they were a director, and the head of uh, IT was a director level, we were, but now we're not. But I, I just think it would be interesting and useful to have a paper to come here is for us to look at options and see what best practice might be. Is that all right with colleagues? Yeah, okay. But without, but without defining an outcome within the paper. Okay, all right. Okay, um, I th and colleagues, in the minutes, anything else we need to look at in the minutes? Um, Cal, sorry. Um, yep, yeah, two quick things. Chair, uh, firstly, I know there was some commentary at the last meeting about members being absent and deputies not being provided. I just wanted to explain that in my personal circumstances, I was unable to attend yeah. at short notice due to being pinged by the app, so yep, it, wasn't, it wasn't practical to provide a deputy, and, no. but I take the point in, in yeah. an ordinary. Um, and just secondly... And Cal, you are a very good attender. Thank you. <laughs> just secondly, in terms of the report... So in terms of the appointment of the subcommittee, which obviously in the minutes, I know that we've had the outcome of that fed back to yeah. us, but I just wondered as a subcommittee of this committee whether there should be a more substantive report back um, in terms of the kind of the reasons or, or some kind of wider information rather than just the outcome, if that makes sense. Because, I mean, I, I mean, on other committees I've been involved in, if a, yeah. if a body is a subcommittee of that committee, there should be some kind of feedback mechanism. Yeah. So, Harry, come on. You're looking for a feedback from the members on the appointment of the director? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, well, I guess the point is if, it's, if the appointment of directors is a function of the employment committee, and that's a function we have outsourced to a subcommittee, it just seems to me as the 
the original body that held that responsibility, we should have some oversight into what happened, so, uh, more, more than just the name of the, the person that was appointed? Um, well, I, I've sat on quite a few, <coughs> and it's never happened before. <coughs> um, I, I, w I would be cautious about doing that, because <coughs> when they deliberate, or when I've done it in the past, and I, and I wasn't on this one, <coughs> The deliberations on the appointment are usually held confidentially, as I understand it. So you are effectively asking for uh, a report which would include parts of the meeting that were confidential and putting it into a public environment. So I would suggest that is not the way to go if that's what you're looking for, particularly if there may well have been um, some disagreements at that point and perhaps the appointment was and I don't know in this circumstance whether the uh, whether the appointment was unanimous or not otherwise you run the risk of of members that disagreed with the appointment making public their dis what they disagreed on and that will potentially undermine that director before they've even taken up the post so I I would not support that it's not practice and I don't think we want something that is confidential put into the public domain which is essentially what this would be um, Jeanette. Jeanette. yeah I wouldn't support that either because it is um, a confidential um, conversation um, I've been on the end when I was um, doing an appointment um, when I was in um, the cabinet um, and um, certain things that I said were leaked um, to others which caused a great deal of problems so um, I don't think this is um, for public um, consumption um, I think it's about the process if you want to report about the process um, then I think um, HR can provide that but I'm not um, convinced that um, we can actually have a discussion without um, talking about the person involved and and I think that breaches their confidentiality and being on the receiving end of that it's it's not a, a great place to be Cal yeah thank you I, I take those points I mean wh what I didn't I didn't have in mind a public report it was more just some understanding of the process um, and anonymized and not so-and-so vote for so-and-so and, -so and, and etc more of things like how many applicants there were, did we go out to the wider market, was there sufficiently qualified candidates from external as well as internal, etc., just to kind of better inform us as employment committee members about how this recruitment is taking place. And again, it's not necessarily saying this has to be put in the public domain, it's more for kind of my and I think our understanding of, of what's taken place. Cal, I think, I think there's a... Uh, the, there could be a useful thing in terms of uh, a, a report in terms of recruitment um, and what the market is like because I know there is some concern at the moment we're fairly difficult to recruit um, to, to a selection of different posts at the council my, my worry about something that refers to as an individual is as Jeanette has said I think that I, I, I think that there is a significant risk, um, both in terms of the successful but also the unsuccessful applicants, uh, and I, I would be I'd be worried about that. But I think a, a a report to us on a regular basis of which could probably include, in terms of recruitment to senior posts, what what the age, what, what the market is like and how the council is doing in terms of recruiting would be quite useful to know um, and if there are any particular areas where there are problems recruiting there are some where we, we effectively we, we, we recruit the whole time we're never not recruiting for children social workers and you're presumably never not recruiting for adult social workers um, but and I think Peter Bolf is always recruiting lawyers, um, but there are other areas which are which are different. But uh, Cal, can we see if we can if we ask HR to produce something and see if it meets your your what you think we need to be doing? Um, but I, I I I would be with others in saying I think we need to be very very careful about feedback about selections for individual posts where candidates 
could be identified. Um, we, I think people have got to, if they're doing the interviews, they've got to feel that they can have those discussions absolutely honestly um, and, and that that will remain confidential. Otherwise, people will, will not be clear and we will end up uh, ending up appointing people who are not of the calibre we would, would want to, to have had. Can we just see how it can we contrive and see how it goes? So is that all right? Is that all right with with everybody else? Okay. All right. Anything else on the minutes? No. Okay. Peter, I think you're. No, no. It'll be Richard up next. Lewis, are you all right there with the sun in your eyes, or do you want to shift? Um, if you want to move down there and plug in a uh, plug in the mic, um, then you might find it less unpleasant. But of course, then you might have to see me, which might be more difficult. I don't know. You might have chosen that specially. Um, okay. So, um, Richard. Peter, do you want to walk? Um, uh, sorry, Richard, do you want to walk us through living wage stuff, or uh, Natasha and Richard, whoever is going to be? I'm happy to introduce the report. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm not going to update you on the workforce. As you know, we currently pay our workforce uh, real living wage rates, but work has been undertaken by the procurement team to engage with the local market and the supply chain um, quite extensively, and so the report before you today provides more detail on the outcome of that engagement. Um, but Richard can take you through a bit more detail on what work has been undertaken, but essentially what we are uh, proposing is that a special meeting of the Employment Committee is held in January to enable time for a proper financial appraisal to be undertaken because we've only last week had the um, Living Wage Foundation announce their increase to £9.90 so there hasn't been time for, for the financial appraisal that, that ought to go with this to inform the committee around uh, what next steps might be. But I will hand over to Richard to take you through the update following engagement with the market. Okay, thank you. Before you go, Richard, um, James, the screen here is, oh, it's now gone completely, um, but before that it was flashing in a, between blue and whatever. Um, I, I don't particularly need to see Simon or whatever on here, but could you check to see what's going out? Because I know we had a problem at, at the cabinet with lack of video, lack of audio. Um, and can we just check to make sure this is working? Yep. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've got the live stream next to me. It is working. Lovely. I believe there's a fault with that screen. Okay. Wonderful. Richard, I'm very sorry. It means I can't see you on double. I can only see you as you. So, uh, Richard, leap in. Okay. Thank you, Lee. That's probably a good thing. Um, I think. In terms of, of update on procurement, the, the main aspects that we've undertaken is a detailed survey and one-to-one -one meetings and forum meetings with high impact providers, predominantly in social care. Um, we undertook a survey around about this time last year, um, but we got back a, a very poor response, which was understandable given the current conditions that the market was facing um, with the lockdown and, and, and things that were, were occurring in care homes at that point. Um, we focused the survey much more onto those high impact suppliers. Um, we gave further time. So, you, Richard, what's a high impact um, supplier? Is it somebody that hits things? No, apologies. Sorry, apologies for the jargon. It's, it's a provider which we know is likely to be paying wages less than um, real living wage at the moment. And a provider that we know is working into a service area which is also having financial pressures, which will mean increasing the budget in those areas is going to be difficult, which predominantly leads us towards um, care contracts. So we, we, we focus the attention in, into those areas. We had also, in the previous survey, met with security contractors, um, cleaning contractors, and what we got back from that was that actually they were paying around about living wage already. Um, and typically we spend a lot less of them as well, so we focus the attention in, into care providers. Um, 
We had back uh, over 40 responses from the 200 that we went to. We have also opened the survey again to try and get some more. Um, and as this, also we, we undertook um, forum meetings with residential providers and domiciliary care providers on a one-to-one -one basis is in a group meeting setting and also um, for one-to-one -one meetings with, with other um, critical providers in that area. In terms of the top level findings that, that we've had back, around about half of the providers seem to be paying living wage rates already, which, which at that point when we asked was £9.50. Um, not many of them seem to be actually accredited to living wage though, so it seems to be something that they are doing without going for the full accreditation. Um, the general feedback from providers is that it's something that pos they would like to do positively, but um, they would need to be financially recompensed for doing so due to significant pressures that they're under. Um, I think the pressures that we're under this year compared to last have, have, have increased. Um, I think there is more competition um, for, for, from other sectors that, that, that can pay more money for potentially um, less stressful jobs. Um, there's also the national insurance increase. There's um, increasing utilities costs and various other aspects. So providers were suggesting that they're, they're already potentially looking at, and obviously the national living wage increase as well at £9.50 in April. So from those providers that aren't paying living wage rates at the moment, um, they're considering that the increases that they could be facing could be somewhere between 4 to 5 percent. Typically, if you add the living wage on top, based upon where we were considering at that point, it could be around 6 to 7 percent instead of 4 to 5. Now we know it's £9.90, it might be nearer to the 6 rather than the 7, but we need to give um, finance and particularly social care finance colleagues the opportunity to properly analyse that. Um, in respect of other issues that the care providers put forward, there, there is a concern on two-tier workforce. So we share a lot of um, providers with Hampshire County Council, um, and there was a concern of, of if Portsmouth have a higher rate, if that can't also then be covered through the Hampshire contracts and potentially causing two-tier workforce issues, um, which came back from some providers, and that there was a level of, of negativity on some of those aspects. Uh, on the positive side, um, providers, if, if, it, if those barriers can be overcome, would see this as being a particularly useful thing for increasing recruitment, where, where they're losing staff at the moment, for increasing the, um, the value perception of, of, of that sector, and, and making sure that the, the care of profession is, is, is properly valued and, 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 and seen as a, as, a, as a proper career path. Um, that they also would see that it could Im, um, positively impact in respect of staff retention um, and, and motivation. And if it can be afforded, there's potentially, uh, and, and we don't have the exact figures on, on any of this, but it was reported that there could be some savings because there'd be less reliance on agency um, workers. And that came that that was a trend that came back not just from the the survey results but also from from the one to one meetings and and the forum meetings that we held as well um, other things that came through was that historically the increases that providers have been given they've felt have, have, have fallen short of what the actual costs are and they've been offsetting some of those costs into private sector packages um, I think there's going to be some friction on that going forward, which um, Andy will be able to better explain than me, but where there is a, a build back better priority of trying to reduce private sector rates to be more in line with public sector, that could mean that that offsetting um, becomes compromised, which could potentially increase costs as well. In terms of the further work that, that we've undertaken, which is the um, peer review, um, and before I go on to that point, is there, is there any questions at all? Uh, Richard, do you want to quick just run through the rest of it? Can you assume that we've read it? Yeah. Um, um, but if you keep, keep running through your bit, then I was going to come to Andy and then see what colleagues were, where colleagues wanted to go from there. Understood. Thank you, Ada. So in, in the peer review, we, we've spoken to Sunderland, as, 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 as instructed by, by the committee at the last meeting. Um, 
In terms of the approach that we would take, we're very, very similar, so our contract pipeline is complete now. Um, the analysis of our pipeline, though, is showing that because a lot of our contracts have um, annual financial uplifts, is that our pipeline would potentially mean that the costs would increase quite significantly in year one, rather than it being a steady profile going up. Um, unless we took a different definition on that uplift process and said, well, unless it's a valid extension, um, then potentially we, we wouldn't increase up to living wage. But our analysis has shown that probably we would have quite a steep jump in year one, rather than it going on, on a steady profile. Um, speaking to Sunderland, I'm not sure how they have done this. I, I could make assumptions, but I'd rather not. All of their high impact contracts in care seem to be have been pushed out into year three. Um, which is quite different to how it, how it would pan out for us. In terms of the overall uplift that they're seeing though, they're, they're estimating 6% um, and they're estimating that by year three they could see a cumulative increase of 3.5 million. So it's not dramatically different to, to, to the numbers that, that we've been reporting. Um, they've su suggested that the suppliers have been largely positive, um, but they haven't really got to those tricky ones yet, I, I, I would suggest, um, by virtue of the social care contracts not coming up yet. Um, they've set real living wage as a pass-fail criteria, so rather than nudging and um, incentivising providers actually making it a, a pass-fail, which if we were to adopt this I would suggest that we, we would probably w would want to do the same to, to ensure we did properly implement. Um, they're still assessing the positive impacts that, that have come through, so that they're, they're, they're relatively early, early days. Um, but they're, they're, they are seeing locally um, local people receiving increases um, in, in, in their pay packets. And the way in which they check that is they have open book audit to make sure they actually get to see the pay packets so that the operators can't be um, effectively keeping the uplift. Um, we've also, um, through, through um, Jess at Living Wage, has put us also in contact with York, so seeking to meet with York very soon. And we've also got a long list of other um, authorities that we'd like to talk to as well. Ideally, we'd like to, before if we go to a, a further committee meeting, spoken to another three or four. Okay, anything else do you need to add, Richard? Uh, the only other aspect is just in terms of procurement implementation. So as I said, we've got the... Um, contract pipeline in place. We've checked that with what Sunderland produced, um, which, which a living wage signed off, and, and we've got parity there, so we've, we have confidence in, in the work that we've done. Uh, in terms of building it into our processes going forward, that's relatively simple. Uh, we can build it into governance processes, into procurement documentation, into contract documents relatively simply. Uh, and in terms of the next steps, we, we would want to effectively meet with finance colleagues and um, social care colleagues to look at what, what's come back from our analysis, feed that into the financial analysis that they've undertaken and, and, bear it and, and take account of the £9.90 which is now being confirmed to produce a more comprehensive report. Okay, thanks very much. Andy, most of this is going to impact social care, adult social care. What are your thoughts? Um, if I just pick up on the point that Richard made around the uh, what, what's been called in government documents a fair price for care, so so many of you will be familiar with the fact that currently a lot of suppliers to adult social care uh, funded through local authorities will supplement um, their profitability, their viability with people that play a private rate which is higher than that paid by the local authority. The government's proposing to bring that to an end as of October 23 when it in, uh, implements the care cost cap and will um, uh, enable people to come to local authorities to take uh, advantage of more advantageous rates. That will doubtless pose providers with some difficulty because either they are no longer viable or they have to increase their prices across the board um, uh, in terms of the rates the council pays. So that's a, a concern from a budget perspective. I think the other bits, and I was just going to go through some, some brief advice from, from an officer's perspective on the other bits that we're concerned about looking forward in, into the next financial year. Um, so we know we've got major problems with domiciliary care. Uh, we don't currently have the same issue or, or on the same scale with residential care. But we know that we've been advised by our providers that our issue with domiciliary care is around pay. 
We know that there are a lot of inducements being offered by the hospitality and retail sectors and that people are moving toward those, uh, those employment opportunities. Why wouldn't you if you can earn more money? Um, we also know that there's, there's been for some years, and it's become sharper in recent times, um, a competition, although not a constructed competition, between the NHS and, and local authority social care. Uh, because the NHS are able to offer uh, better terms and conditions, a better career structure, they have a national workforce strategy and all of those things that, that you'll be aware of. And so we are also seeing some of the workforce that would traditionally work in adult social care depart for NHS uh, employment. Um, We've also seen um, an increased number of people looking for a service, which we've highlighted before in other reports. And so whilst we're seeing less ability to provide that service, we're seeing more demand for it. Adult social care is demand-led, which pushes us under considerable pressure and makes it more difficult to, to balance the budget. So I think what we're seeing is, is something for us which feels like a bit of a perfect storm. And when we saw the, the output from the spending review last month in October, we didn't see any reference to a social care grant. We saw a precept that was suggested to be limited to 1% on the council tax for adult social care. Um, and we had the, the care cap costs uh, proposal repeated with the view that that would resolve the, the financial difficulties there are in adult social care and the care difficulties. Um, we can't see that that will happen. Um, we're concerned that once the NHS is granted new finance, which it rightly needs, it will be very difficult to remove that finance from the NHS to give it to local authorities for adult social care. We're also concerned that the plan, in its essence, talks about limiting the cost that people will pay in their lifetime, some people will pay in their lifetime for adult social care. It doesn't talk about baseline investment, dealing with demographic challenges, the demand that I just referred to. And so um, within adult social care, across the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services and across the NHS Confederation, we're very concerned that we're not seeing a, um, a sufficient injection of resource in adult social care to make it viable and to keep providing at the level we are now. We know that as a local authority, we've seen a, a around about 10.7 million increase in the last few years, purely to stand still and provide some of the services that we've been providing. So forgive me for, for, for going into all of those things, but I think that brings me to my concern that whilst I don't think anyone would argue with the foundation living wage, it will put us under even more pressure. We already believe, and we haven't got this analysis 100% yet, we're still doing it, but we already believe that we'll be looking at north of three million pounds just based on the national living wage increases that we'll have to make in the next financial year um, for our suppliers and adult social care. The 1% precept on the council tax is worth in the nature of 870,000, which doesn't come close to that. Now, I think Richard's absolutely right. We need a really clear financial analysis of what foundation living wage could be so that you can make a decision, so that the council can make a decision. We don't have that yet, but if we're talking out about a potential £3 million for the national living wage, for the foundation living wage on top of that, if we're talking another £1, £2 million, we're seeing a pressure that I'm not sure how we could manage in terms of our savings plans, in terms of keeping social care viable. Now, obviously, that, that's a, a decision for the council, but that's broadly my advice on what I see at the moment. But happy to take any questions. OK. Um, Andy, I think my, my worries around some of the providers handing back contracts um, and, and therefore saying they don't want to work for the council any, for the, or provide services on behalf of the council anymore. How big a problem is that? And are, are wage rates an issue in terms of their ability to rec recruit staff? At the moment in Portsmouth, it's not, it's not the same size of the problem that I know it is over the border in, in Hampshire, for our neighbours in Hampshire and for larger authorities. We've been relatively well shielded from handbacks. We've now seen three providers hand back We've seen two providers hand back some work because they've lost staff, and we've seen one provider, a smaller provider in, in Portsmouth, um, decide to exit the market in Portsmouth. So we've been, seen three in total. That's been a, a total, if memory serves, and I may get the numbers slightly wrong, of about 20 to 30 people. 
as in people who have packages of care. So it's relatively small. Um, wages are most certainly an impact. Um, we know that locally, and I won't name them, but there are some retailers who are offering, offering 1250 regardless of your age, plus a 10% discount if we're talking about supermarkets. There are other retailers that are offering um, those kind, that kind of money, plus a two to three thousand pound bonus after three to six months working for them. And our, our rates, our carers are paid on national living wage. That's what they're paid on, and we, we can't compete with that. Thanks. Um, uh, useful but worrying. Okay, colleagues, who would like to go? Um, should we do? Yes, Liz. Just a quick one. On the engagement front, so it says that the of the high impact suppliers, out of the 200 surveys, 40 come back. And then we've got that half of them do currently pay, but aren't accredited, so aren't given what we've heard probably likely to be able to afford to carry on. So out of that, are we talking that, so out of the 200, so 20 have come back that do, that aren't going to, so the rest aren't, or...? Yes, yes that, 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 that's correct. So it was roughly from the sample um, response that came back, it was, it was roughly down the middle in terms of paying the current £9.50 rate that when we went out was the real living wage rate of pay. Um, as, as you rightly point out though, quite a few of those providers, the majority aren't, at, aren't living wage accredited, so they wouldn't have to increase um, to, to £9.90 necessarily. That's not to say they wouldn't. And that's not to say that wages aren't going to have to increase anyway because of the um, pressures um, that, 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 that they're facing from competing markets, as, as Andy alluded to, with supermarkets and other jobs. Cool. Can I ask Can, one of course, more? Yeah, of course. Um, the other bit you mentioned that I didn't see anywhere in the report was regarding the audits that some of them mentioned they were doing post-implementing this. Has that also been costed for what... I've not seen any costings on that, if we were to do that, if we did implement this. Uh, we haven't costed for any additional resource. It would create a level of additional pressure into predominantly um, adult social care contracting, um, because it would require us to, to skill up and, and, and to, to, to engage um, more intensely in the contract management side of things. Um, I think in terms of the impact of that, Andy would be better to um, to give you an answer on that, but it, it wouldn't be something that I think would be um, huge in terms of in terms of a resource increase. I think it would just be a case of, of mostly just upskilling, and and there's a lot of very good contract management practice in that area anyway, as, as this had to be um, with the pressures that the market is under. Okay, are you all right with that, Lewis? Cal. Thank you, um, Chair. I've got a number of questions. Firstly, in terms of the likely costings, so I know that the figure in here about £3.2 million, I think, is from a, a report, a previous report, um, that also contains information um, about the HRA, which then, as I understand, proved not to be kind of too factually based, i.e., incorrect. So, uh, how sure are we about this 3.2 million figure? And I know that we're going to obviously do further analysis um, of a new figure to be brought to a, to a January meeting. I would find it useful, I don't know about the rest of the committee, but just to get a greater insight, I guess, into the process by which these figures um, are being calculated so that we can be assured that we're making a decision based on the best information available. Okay. Richard or Sue? Yes, the 3.2, what you're correct, was the figure that was quoted in a previous report. So could you bring your mic down? Sorry. Yes, the 3.2 million was the figure quoted in the previous report when we were looking at the uh, living wage going up to three point, uh, to, to £9.50. So that was just left in the report as illustration. We haven't yet got all the information we need to do the, to the, do the new calculations, but once we've got that, we will give you a more accurate figure for the new 40 pence increase. 
Okay. I mean, just to follow up on that, Chair, I think what I would find useful is maybe an informal briefing ahead of the January meeting just to look at the figures in a bit fine. more detail than we might otherwise do in a public meeting. Yeah, I think that, that might sounds be helpful. fine. Um, if I've got a couple of other questions, if I can come through. Uh, I'd be interested to know, I know the report talks about the, the current practice in terms of procurement being um, incentivisation around the living wage as opposed to making it a mandatory requirement which hopefully we'll go on to do in future. How has that incentivisation worked? Um, and of the kind of the recent significant contracts that have been awarded, have they paid living wage? Do we know what the kind of split is of, on how that's working out? Uh, I don't have the exact numbers. In terms of how we, we're incentivising, it's, it's effectively through the social value policy that we adopted in March. And one of the commitment areas that we ask for, we don't mandate, but we, we, we incentivise towards it. So there is the means of, of achieving higher scores in the tender evaluation uh, is, is the number of employees that are actually paid on, on real living wage rates. Um, from the piloting of, of, of that model, a lot of it has, has been piloted into um, works contracts, um, big term service contracts and, 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 and the like, Let, less so into the social care contracts, but we're starting to move those in. I'd say in respect of the works contracts, so for instance, if, if, we're, if we're building a, a, the new cruise terminal has is, 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 is got the social value commitments in there, I'd expect to see when, when those tenders come back that pretty much everyone on that is going to be paid living wage because of the, the nature of the trade. Um, in the housing contracts that we have out with the term service providers, Again, with the commitments that we've got back on there, I'd expect to see that they're all, um, again, on, 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 on real living wage, so probably significantly higher. Um, we're also doing work at the moment with Colas Ensign to retrospectively fit some of these um, social value um, monitoring tools and commitments into that contract. So in terms of broad implementation, uh, I can't give you exact numbers, but we are seeing where we have applied it in those markets that generally people are paying those those rates but I think where we will see less uptake is, is going to be in the high impact areas which is social care. Um, we did have one exercise that we did um, it was actually for a housing contract but more linked into the care market which was the um, homeless support and when we broached through market testing with the with, with the providers um, if we were to put a pass fail on real living wage, um, three out of the four came back and said that wouldn't be a problem. One of the providers came back and said that would be quite a significant issue and if you mandated it we might not be able to bid. And, and they were, well, I can't it's obviously in confidence, but they were a significant provider to the authority. So I don't think that might be, I, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a one in four that we would get a pass back, but there will be some providers out there that won't be able to work with it, particularly with the Hampshire context. Um, in the two-tier workforce issues. Turn up. Okay. Thought had been cancelled then. Um, I understand this might be a question for Andy, but I understand early on in the year there were a few pretty significant, i.e. running into the millions of pounds a year, new adult social care contracts awarded. Um, do we know whether the living wage was included within those? The contracts has not won them. Uh, which contracts should you be referring to, Kevin? There you go. Um, so I know that there was um, contractors, one in particular that I've got in mind was a contractor that was um, awarded to provide care services at properties owned, I think they're extra care buildings around the city. I think there was four quite significant ones, so it kind of was a contract in total of several million pounds a year. Um, I just wondered whether you knew off the top of your head whether that provider committed to pay to living wage as part of that process. I'm afraid I don't, so I'd have to come back to you on that. Um, yeah, yes, I know the contract you're talking about, so I can find that out relatively easily, and I can, I can uh, let the committee know for the minutes. Okay, thank you. I've got a couple more. Do you want me to yeah. stop now? Okay, okay. Go okay. Um, I'm just curious about, so I understand that we've asked providers about whether they would pay living wage if we required it for them, and we've obviously taken their responses and said, some people have said yes, some people have said no. Now, 
in the highly unlikely scenario I was a chief, became a chief executive of a care company and I was asked that question, I would probably say no. So what wider analysis have we done of the actual cost sensitivity of those contracts, i.e. have we done any kind of economic analysis of the likelihood of them actually handing back the contracts if we were to require it, as opposed to just taking their word for it? Um, well, we haven't done the detailed analysis that you were suggesting there. We, we, had, we had limited time uh, and, and, a, and a quite a broad cross-section of providers to try and engage with. But there was also a series of one-to-one -one meetings and forum meetings. And predominantly what came back from the market for those that aren't paying, weren't paying the £9.50 at that point was it is something that they would certainly want to do but they would need to be financially recompensed back in the majority of cases to do it so that the contracts would need to be uplifted. And the other aspect that, kept, that came back that, that would cause a bit of a complication um, for some and, and, and quite negatively from others was in respect of where, there, where same members of staff uh, might be working on a Portsmouth contract and then a Hampshire contract and actually them having to tell those members of staff that, well, you can't be paid that amount for the, for the Hampshire contract and the issues that they could face from it. Um, but pre predominantly, it would be a, a pass back in terms of the um, financial pressure. Um, so some said that they could absorb it, but a lot of the providers um, were saying that in, in previous years, the uplift that they've been receiving hasn't been sufficient. And that, as Andy was suggesting, we're, we're, we're getting to a point this year where there's further significant financial pressures that would make that even harder. Can I ask, um, when, if we commit to doing the real living wage, that commits us to £9.90 an hour, but does it commit us to, if there's a, uh, if there's an allowance for weekend working or whatever, which is a multiple of their normal their normal hourly rate, does that commit us to paying that uplift on that um, that extra rate, or is our commitment to nine pounds ninety as the real living wage? I'll have to double check that, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that the commitment is just to nine pounds ninety. Okay, so we would need to work with employers around that, and if employers come back to us and say, okay, you're going to pay the real living wage at 990, um, but that means we need to, 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 to change differentials higher up the wage structure for, for managers, etc., uh, are we... Uh, are we committed to, to recompensing them for that? Um, would you like me to answer? Or? Leave um, we, we wouldn't. We wouldn't be committed, but there, there, we would have pressures there, and then that came back from the survey and, and the one-to-ones. If we move up to nine pounds ninety, that's going to not put a lot of difference between the frontline worker and the supervisor. And then that might mean that the supervisors might become disgruntled and look for work elsewhere or demand increases. Um, going back to the first point that you made, whilst we wouldn't have a commitment to uplift um, for weekend working, if the differential between normal hours working and weekend working reduced, then the incentivisation to work on weekends might also reduce. Okay, thanks. Um, Darren. Thanks, Gerald. Um, <clears throat> and um, thank you for this paper, Richard. This is, um, this is a very good um, analysis of the situation. Um, I support all the recommendations, um, and I want to offer some suggestions as to some of the things that we can include as part of that financial impact analysis and some comments along the way. Cal, the reason I was very, very clear previously is because I'd actually talked with the housing department about actually bringing in the real living wage uh, for our main contractors are big contractors because that's where the problems lay. Uh, and so that's why I was a bit more confident than I would otherwise normally be about the financial impact. And I'm pretty sure that, I will, that the figure that will be provided by the team to Natasha for this report in January will be something akin to what I believe is the case, which is very little. Uh, because we've done that work already. So that's why I was a bit more confident about that. Um, <clears throat> I think the, this is a highly sobering report. For me, I wanted to, to do this across the whole council. 
Um, this is highly sobering for, for a range of reasons. But I want to test out a few things, some of which have been dealt with already. I also like your idea of an informal briefing because there will have to be some specific financial figures that we're going to have to include in this, which we may not want to have in a, in a public report. Um, I want to, um, most of my comments are around page 13 and the bullet points on page 13. Um, I want to check a few things with, with people, starting with Andy at bullet point four, uh, which is around the, the comparison with supermarkets and everything else. If we were to go in the care sector to £9.90 an hour from April, is, will that mean that companies will stop handing back contracts and care packages will not be handed back? Or is the gap between, say, £11.50 or £12.50, you're getting, you're getting little, and the £9.90 we offer at care, be so great that actually the situation won't change? I think if I was being... That's a simple yes or no answer. Yes. <laughs> okay. I thought it might be. I think if I was being completely honest with you, I'd say we don't know. I think what we're hearing from our providers, and we have very regular conversations with them, and I'm really pleased that Richard's highlighted the work that he's done because we've been engaging with them very intensely in the past couple of years or so. Um, what they're saying to us is people still want to work in care. Care is still very much a vocation, which we'd obviously be pleased about, you know, the people that want, want to do it and, and see huge value in it. I think it will help because at the moment we're talking around about 890 odd, 880, whichever it is. So if we were to move upwards by a pound an hour, per, you know, circa, I think it would help. I think it would help keep people in, in, in the caring profession. Um, and I think it would make it easier for us to attract people. Whether it would completely cease. We're, we're wanting to do a piece of work at the moment which is to talk to our our colleagues in the council uh, who are very closely involved with businesses and retail in the sector and understand where they think the recruitment drive is going, whether there is an end point to it, whether it is just a continuous thing because of the, the number of vacancies in the workplace and whether we've then got a risk envelope. So I think after having done that bit of work, I'd probably be able to give a better informed answer, but it'll certainly be an incentive. I will, uh, it's up to you. Gerald and colleagues, but I think that piece of work should form part of this report in January, because the care sector seems to be ground zero um, in terms of in terms of delivering this. Um, I think the next bit is bullet, is your bullet point five, Richard, which effectively is the differentials discussion, which we've just been having. Now, one of my understandings is that a lot of the money and the figures in this report as to how much it costs relate to differentials. In other words, you increase the real living wage to £9.90, and then as Gerald has said, the let, let's, let's take the clean and green team, for sake of argument. Okay? Let's assume they weren't on, let's say the cleaners of council estates weren't on £9.90, but they were on 8 quid. They're not, but let's assume they were for a second. And their supervisor was on the tenner. And they got to £9.90, and their supervisor is insisting that they got up to 12 quid. Now, that is the source of the union's local government pay claim last year and this year, which I understand. Uh, personally, I think a cleaner would be delighted, um, but they wouldn't be so delighted if their supervisor got the same. Um, so I'm less keen on differentials. And I think one of the key differences in this argument is the current local government pay claim that has been rejected by the unions actually has a deliberate reduction of differentials. So for, that, for spine point one, in other words, the lowest paid, they get a pay rise of 2.75%. The, the, the people earning the most get a pay rise of 1.5%, and everyone else gets 1.75%. So that reduction in differentials already exists in a way it didn't before. Uh, but I think one of the things we do need to know is exactly how much of the £3.2 million actually is related to differentials and how much of it is actually related to the wage. Because then I, th I think, and it's up to colleagues to decide, that then there's a political decision as to whether we go stuff the differentials. I would say that the local, the employer's pay claim is supported by all the political groups and the local government association, so this is not a, not a partisan point, but I would like to see some of that in. Um, I think one of the other things... I can I give a, a, an initial reply to that, if you, if you Of course you can, yeah, feel free. Yes, yes, so I think we can... We can isolate those numbers because what we do every year um, in domiciliary care in the main but also in residential care is look at the uplift that we're offering as a local authority 
and then chunk it down into what relates to the national living wage, uh, what relates to a profit margin, travel, overheads, training, that kind of thing. We've got a model that we use. So working with Richard, I think we can probably provide that estimate. I think it'll be helpful, and that relates actually to my fourth point, which is we're going to need to do some modelling as part of this financial report. Um, the government has been has finally endorsed the Royal Pay Commission's approach to the national living wage and has therefore done a 5.6% pay increase, which means that the national living wage from April will be what the real living wage is now. So therefore I would hope, I, Gerald and colleagues, it's up to you, but I would want to see in this report um, how much we're going to have to pay anyway, through the national living wage increase. And I would also like to see some modelling for 5.6% pay increases in years two and years three. We have to assume that um, because the government says it is committed to a high wage, high productivity economy. And this appears to be one of the ways in which it happens. So it's not unrealistic to do that. And then again, I think model how much we'd have to pay anyway through the national living wage. Secondly, how much extra we would have to pay in terms of actually delivering, again, a 40p pay rise an hour, in terms of the, the real living wage, again, over the next two to three years. Because what I want to ask, how much we're going to have to cough up anyway? How much extra the real living wage will really cost? And that's, that's where this and the differentials argument starts kicking in. Um, and then I think the third point, because I know there are some people in the city that want this to happen, is how much would it actually cost if we were to implement this from April? all of it. On day one, on the first day of April in the 2022-2023 financial year, I know that because some people in the city want that to happen, and I think we should understand what the consequences, that's a perfectly valid point, and I think we should understand what the consequences of that are in terms of finance and in terms of everything else, because if we've got yearly uplifts instead of year three, which is what Sunderland is doing, in one respect that's actually quite easy, but in another respect that may be a bit more money than we might have, and um, we might not have that money. I mean, what you've just said about the supposed increase in grants scares me witless, frankly. Um, so I would hope that would be included, but again, it's up to colleagues to decide. I think on the final Darren, point... can you... Yes, I have one more point. Good. At one point, which is saying we should be more comfortable, actually, around um, the relationship between Hampshire uh, and us than we could either be, because some of the authorities in here, I'm particularly thinking of York, I'm particularly thinking of Brighton, I'm certainly thinking of Preston and Milton Keynes, are authorities that are in the same boat. And indeed, uh, York, Milton Keynes and Brighton are in the same boat, because they're also small unitary authorities that also have relationships elsewhere. Um, so I'm a bit more comfortable about some of the nightmare scenarios about it won't work because it'll be two tier authorities. Um, but I would like to see some of that peer work in there too. So I think we've got a good, a potentially a very, very good report. But I think in order to be honest with us, you have to be straight about what we're going to have to do, the extra costs, the real extra costs, no extra costs of differentials and anything like that, uh, and also the real impacts. And then I think we'll be able to do this. But this is a very excellent and very sobering report. Uh, and I'm actually more scared than I was coming into this meeting about whether we can do this, which we all want to do. Um, but we need honesty and we need openness. And I hope that can happen. And I'm sorry about that, Gerald, for going on for too long. That's fine. Um, can I ask, uh, Richard, I'm conscious that um, in the peer review bit, I think every council, or there are none of the councils you've listed, which is a Conservative-run council there, and I just think it is, for, for balance, it would be helpful to look at some Conservative councils who who are accredited living wage employers um, to, to make sure that we've got feedback from them as well, so that um, the ones I... Looking through them, I think Kensington and Chelsea are difficult just because they've got money coming out of their ears. Um, that may not be their technical term, but, but, but they, are, they have a lot of money, which we don't. I wonder about Hounslow, Lancashire and Cornwall. I, I know in Cornwall it was brought in by different groups, but, but it's now being implemented. I just think it would be helpful to make sure that we are, we are spread across all the political parties. The, um, the list of councils that, that are on, on there are all of the unitary authorities um, that have signed up to living wage, so we, we, we didn't analyse by political parties. Okay, but Hounslow is a unitary authority? Uh, well, not unitary, as a, a unitary It's a London borough, borough, but it counts. Yeah, so um, uh, Cornwall is a unitary authority. It is a county, but it counts. Yeah. Uh, it, um, 
so we need to make sure that we, we it's, it's delivering the, the same range of services, particularly social care, is the important bit. That, that was essentially the cut-off, is making yeah. sure that... So, so could you care. add Cornwall, Lancashire, Hounslow to your little list? Thanks, Cal. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I mean, if we're done with questions, I've got some comments. Well, yeah, but I, 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 I'm not sure I... The, the artificial break between questions and comments, I think, is never helpful, but anyway... Okay, no problem. That's just how we'd previously done it on this committee, so that's how I thought we were working. Um, yeah, but thank, thank you very much for bringing the report. I appreciate it. There's a lot of kind of time and effort has gone into getting things to this stage, um, and there's going to be a lot more work going forward, particularly to get this next report for, for January, so that, that is appreciated. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to emphasise really kind of how important this is as an issue. I do think it's one of the biggest issues facing the city and us as a local authority is that it's a scandal of people who are working in, in some of the most important jobs in our city actually being some of the worst off and having to live lives um, where they're in, in work poverty. In terms of the, the, the risk of creating a two-tiered workforce, I mean, there is a simple solution to that for employers and, excuse me, for being a little bit flippant, but just pay all your staff for living wage. Um, and secondly, there's a wider point there about actually there's already a two-tier workforce within public services. There's a three- or four-tier workforce because you've already got people who work directly for the council who are on one set of terms and conditions and actually multiple set of terms and conditions within that. Then you've got these people who are working in outsourced council services, which is what these are, remember. These are council services that are almost entirely often funded by the local authority but have been outsourced to private companies or charities. And you have a another set of workers there on a completely different um, set of terms and conditions. So this separation of tiers within the workforce does already exist, and I think we need to recognise that. Um, with, with, in terms of the Hampshire County Council contacts, I know obviously there's potentially people on this committee who have got better contacts than me with elected representatives in Hampshire County Council, um, so perhaps some, that's something that they could take up with them to hopefully encourage them to act in step with us in terms of ensuring that all staff are paid a fair wage. Um, I think it's also worth picking up on, because I think sometimes this is an assumption that all care companies are out small family-run businesses running on very small margins. And, and way, while that may be true in some cases, actually a lot of the companies that contracted to provide care services in Portsmouth are large national corporate firms where if you look at their annual accounts, run profits in the millions, if not tens of millions, have chief execs on three, four hundred grand. So I think there is a little bit of money swirling around the system somewhere, and it seems to go to the people at the top, not the people that actually providing services on the bottom. So I think we need to remember that uh, as well. I think we also, it's important that, I think a, f a slight frustration I've had in the reports that we've had on the living wage is that there's a lot of discussion about the costs and the risks and not very much about the benefits and the opportunities. I would like to see any further reports really focus on, on the wider benefits of paying people a proper living wage, that the benefits to them and their families, but also the benefits to us as a city, the benefits of the local businesses that they're going to go and spend that money in, because they're not going to put it in the bank more than likely. They are going to go to the local pub, to local hairdressers, to local restaurant, and put that money back into the local economy. And of course, some of that money then comes back to the council in council tax or various other um, forms of taxation. So I think we need to take a wider, more holistic view of, of the opportunities uh, as well as the costs of doing this. Um, and, and just picking up on Darren's um, request for kind of further options analysis, I guess, I would like to add a further option um, that might be worth looking at, even if it's a, a quite limited um, form of analysis in terms of the costs, is how much it would cost to bring these services back in-house. Because I know that one of the big costs has always been, well, actually, we'd have to make up that wage differential between um, what the council would pay someone and what they're being paid in the private sector. But actually, if we're requiring these private sector providers to pay at least a living wage, which is the minimum amount the council would do, then maybe some of those cost differ differentials fall away and it might become more viable to bring them back in-house. Um, so I'd like to see that as an option, um, if it was possible. And, and I guess just to conclude, just to emphasise the point that... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the delivering wage for carers and other outsourced workers is an essential thing that we have to do. Um, if, if we have to find the money and force the providers to do the right thing, then that is what needs to be done. 
and ultimately for me it's about ending the injustice, as I said earlier, of those doing the most important jobs in the city and being made to live in, in work poverty and being the worst off people in our communities. Uh, thanks, Cal. Um, Jeanette, I know you were trying to come in. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, if ever there was a heart and head decision, this is going to be it. Um, my heart says one thing, my head says another. Um, there's not enough detail in the report financially f to make a decision and it would have to then go to full council. So people can politicise this all they like, but there, it, there is a, a basic decision to be made, really, whether we can afford to do this. Um, so that's the only comment I would make, but what I would like to ask is if Andy could do a briefing paper to the next Health and um, Social Care Committee, um, just so that they're informed and we can see the, what the issues are, what the benefits are for adult social care going forward, because they're going to be the biggest problem. Um, everybody else, um, you know, says it's a small problem in housing and things like that, but for adult social care, which is our main um, issue, that's going to be um, a financial hit. So if, if you could provide a paper, um, basically on what you've just said um, to here, to the ASC, then we can um, at least have a discussion there as well. Uh, I just need to check with the chair, but yes, most certainly. So I, I think this has been a journey the council has been on for some time, and I, I'm I'm very keen that we try we try to do this together across all parties. I'm we made the move to become to pay our our own staff the real living wage a while ago, uh, and then during the Conservative administration that that wasn't continued, but we've now brought that back. But I want to see if we if we're now going to move to becoming a real living wage employer and accredited so that all our contractors are doing it as well. I want to see if we can do this as something that we're all going to support so that um, it, it has cross-party support. Um, I, I've talked to people in Cornwall where the feedback that I had was that this w uh, was very a very good thing in terms of um, the local care market because it meant people chose to remain working in the care market and not go and do seasonal tourist jobs. It may of course mean that's why some restaurants were closed because they couldn't get waiting stuff. Um, but, but actually our job is to try to make sure that we're looking after the most vulnerable people in the society and adult social care has got an enormously important part in that. So I'm, I'm pleased we're moving down. We have got to be realistic about the money though. Um, um, the government keeps saying that there's lots more money coming to adult social care across all parties of the local government association. There is an absolute clear recognition that that just is not happening. That all the talk about health and social care stuff um, uh, only produces money for local authorities three years time. So the next few years is a real problem for us. And as Andy has, has, has said, there's going to be big pressure. Where we don't want to end up is in the place where we decide to do one thing to support increasing people's wages. On the other hand, we're going to have to say, well, fewer people can receive a service. Because that would be a, a very bad place for us to be. So we need to look at this really, really carefully. Um, I am also of the view that we should have um, our in-house social care, um, a home care team. Um, and Andy and I have discussed this several times. Um, and I think that the area where potentially it could work best for us is, is in terms of providing a service for the first six weeks when people come out of hospital, in terms of doing assessment, reablement, working out what's required and then moving people on to, if there's, they have long term needs, then using the private sector for that. Um, but we'll have to see. And one of our issues, as I understand from Andy, is uh, is the allowances we pay for evenings, weekends, etc., which might mean that it is significantly more expensive for the council to provide this in-house than than going to a care provider. But we will we will need to work this stuff through. Um, but but my preference, 
would be for people to work with the city council because I think the experience from housing, from clean and green, etc., is that we mean we we keep people and we keep people longer and we get a, a better service out of it over time. But but we need to look at it properly um, over, over time. Colleagues, I think the idea of having a, a more detailed discussion in an informal session is a very sensible one um, because we need to start moving to a decision pretty quickly and, and budget is coming down the line um, like a freight train. Um, so things aren't, aren't, aren't we'll, we'll need to move on this. So we'll need a report to the January meeting but we might need a, a, a discussion informally in December as well when Richard's been able to grab us some more information. Colleagues, are you, I know this has been quite long, but it's a really important issue. Are, is, are you all right with that, colleagues? Yeah, okay. All right, thank you very much indeed, everybody, for that. Um, moving on, um, Peter, thanks very much indeed. Sickness absence. Um, thanks for your report. Anything you think we need to know on top of the report? No, if you've uh, read it, uh, I was just going to take you through the uh, highlights, but... Um, well, no, no, take us through the highlights. Who have yeah. you got to be seriously worried about? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's positive that we've actually this quarter seen a reduction um, in overall sickness down to uh, 9.03 average days per person per year, the lowest so far this year. Long-term absences decreased from 6.67 to 6.04. We've seen a slight increase in um, short-term absence um, from 1.56 to 1.7 average days per person. Psychological uh, um, illness remains the um, highest reason for absence, um, but that's now um, being followed up by coronavirus, which is now ranked uh, number two. Just really to note from the wellbeing section, you'll see that we've launched um, the 2021 flu vaccination program where staff are able to obtain e-vouchers. Um, so far, to date, we have seen 522 employees uh, request the vouchers, but also communication um, along with that program has included information on the COVID vaccination and booster jabs. Um, we've also launched a new carer support network in addition to all of the other um, great wellbeing initiatives that are being worked on. Okay. Any questions? Okay, colleagues, questions? Jeanette? Yeah, um, just one on the uh, coronavirus. Do we know how many um, are starting to... Uh, Jeanette, have any of your mics on? It's not on. Right, can you hear me now? Bill? Um, how many of those staff in the coronavirus section are suffering from long COVID? Um, and can we, if, if we don't know that, can we start splitting them off who are sort of um, doing that? Because obviously we've got a... Um, a committee about long COVID, um, and it'll be interested to see how staff fit into that. I'm going to have to take that one back uh, away and look into it. Thank you. Uh, but very sensible question. I, I, I know people who've got long COVID, and it, it is devastating for them. And know people who've worked in the public sector who, who've effectively had to retire early because they just cannot now sustain a full-time job. So it'd be useful to know. Okay. Cow. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just a few quick ones on this. Firstly, obviously, um, it's positive to see that sickness absence overall has decreased. Um, and if I might speculate, I think we kind of previously had discussions around this, that probably at least one of the factors is the increased ability for people to work flexibly and remotely. Um, and I think that should be kind of recognised as, as a positive contribution that that's making towards the council and its ability um, to run its services. Just on the flip side of that, I guess a word of warning, we probably also need to be aware of the risk that linked to that people may be working when they're not well enough to be working if they can actually just log on from home or even log on from their bed actually if it's a, a slight cold maybe that's okay but obviously if sometimes people are unwell they do need to rest um, and I would just ask I guess for reassurance that that message is being fed through the systems so that it managers are aware of that um, and uh, just a second question um, 
In terms of the reasons for absence, I note that we're now reporting, um, as I think we've previously requested, a separate category for work-related stress, anxiety and depression, and that is being listed um, as 2,076 days, which is obviously quite significant for work-related reasons. Um, I just wondered if we could be told a little bit more about what measures are being put in place to address that work-related stress, anxiety and depression. Yeah, okay, so um, we, we really are looking at preventative, so uh, again, uh, there, there's a lot of work for the um, well-being officer. Um, we've also looked at increasing our, um, uh, just have a quick look. Our employee, uh, employee assistance program, we, we've looked to increase the support there. Um, so it's, it's really about the, the education. So, and, and Natasha, do you want to jump in as well? Yeah, we're, we're also um, increasing the number of wellbeing champions that we have across the organisation to support more directly when, when staff are experiencing any kind of stress. And we're also working with the health and safety team on developing uh, stress risk assessments. Uh, with the idea of identifying any particular issues before they arise and before they become a problem so that managers then have the tools and resources to support staff before they then suffer longer term issues around stress, whether it's work related or, or personal. Do I think we need to be realistic that some of the roles we have here at the City Council are, are very stressful roles. Doing some of the children's social care work involve very disturbing things that, that, that are very, very upsetting for people, um, and, and some roles that we have at the City Council mean that um, people fulfilling those roles sometimes get, a, get abuse from members of the public. Um, uh, having seen how somebody reacts to a parking ticket, um, people do not operate in a rational, always, people don't always operate on a rational basis, um, and I know that can be very unpleasant for people who are at the end of that. I think I'd, I'd also add, I think that that's, that's quite correct, so some of the things that we're also looking at are, um, are um, incident reporting procedures. We've got a, a stakeholder group looking at um, how we report incidents to enable a greater awareness around how that can be reported and then subsequently investigated because that's probably a weakness that we've had previously um, in terms of follow-up around those sorts of things but the training that we're now delivering to our management population to support them with the ability to manage teams that are working remotely also covers how to manage a remote team and staff well-being so there's a number of different things um, that are underway to to support both staff and managers in in managing the stress and anxiety a lot of the stress and anxiety we know from our staff well-being surveys is also related to what we're seeing more generally in society around the pandemic and anxieties around um, the pandemic effect okay Carol anything off no that answered my questions thank you Okay, anything else on this one? But no, okay, thanks very much indeed for that. Very helpful. Let's turn over. Colleagues, um, the next ones are, um, are, are things that, I, that are coming to Chris Atwell's um, uh, cabinet meeting, but I thought actually members would find them interesting and useful. So they're not here for us for any decision, but just so that there is a wider group. Some people will be at that meeting because they're op spokesmen on, on that as well, but, but not all of us will be. So I just thought that things would be, this would be useful for, for others to see. Um, and I don't know if anybody's got any quick comments on any of these, but, but to note that these are not for, for our decision. Jean Jeanette? Yeah, unfortunately, um, they've changed the date for the no. um, meeting, so I can't then attend. So um, just a sort of a quick um, uh, couple of comments, really. Of course. Um, and, and, and if you can't, can somebody make sure that your comments here are reflected when we get well, to I'll the... Well, I'll be feeding in a uh, okay, to it anyway, okay, so don't, good. don't worry about that. Um, uh, the, the sort of couple of comments really is on um, the, the second report of, um, in, about sort of workforce. Is, is that 
part of the discussion yet. Um, and it's really about um, the workforce female male split um, and um, apologies to um, a previous uh, member of this committee, um, Councillor Stubbs, because I know he, he likes the gender pay gap, um, not, um, but um, it's whether we can have an update on the gender pay gap, bearing in mind on the, these figures. I'm also concerned we have 50% um, workforce that are 45 and over, so what is our succession planning for that, um, and where are the future managers coming from. Um, and the um, obviously the average salary um, is 29,661 for male, 27,862 for female. Why is that? What, what is driving that? Um, and um, the other one is um, about um, BAME, uh, BAME community. Um, we are 95% white, 5% BAME. Um, and what are we doing to address that? Because that is extremely low um, um, based on the figures of our um, communities we serve. Um, we don't seem to be representing the communities we serve, basically. Um, so that, that's just quick sort of questions rather than um, a comment on the report, which I will then put into the um, communities. If you could address those, that would be great. Thank you. So a gender pay gap report will be coming to the March committee. That's part of the annual cycle. And um, I've also asked for an um, ethnicity pay gap report to be done for that report, the, that meeting as well. Um, the point around all of the things that you've raised is why I've started to do these workforce profile reports because I think it's, as you rightly point out, we've got some issues that if we don't address, if we don't understand the workforce, we can't do anything to address because we won't know where those particular pinch points are. So you're absolutely right to point out an older uh, workforce, the gender gap, uh, the gender split um, of male to female and the proportion of uh, our staff and the extent to which they represent the local community. So the intention is to use this information to get much deeper level understanding of the workforce um, and in particular work with um, particular groups. So on the BAME point, for example, I'm working with the Staff Race Equality Network to understand some of the barriers to employment from some of our ethnic communities. Um, and they developed a race equality action plan um, that I'm in the process of assigning owners to. A lot of that does focus on on the extent to which that we are an inclusive workplace um, for people from ethnic communities, but also to understand how we go out to recruit and then what our recruitment processes are and what our conversion rates are from applicant to actual employment. The report does identify, um, one of the reports identifies that currently we don't collect any data from applicants. We are implementing a new recruitment system next year which will give us information on the diversity profile of all applicants so we can start to analyse that data as well to understand who's actually applying for jobs and therefore what targeting we need to do and the extent to which there might be barriers in the process that we need to address. So all of that is, is sort of actions that are um, included in the race quality action plan that we're now working up. Um, but yes, you rightly identify succession planning as an area we need to give focus to, um, as well as understanding sort of the pay rates and the differentials against different protected characteristics. And we need to actually start measuring some of the um, other protected characteristics that we haven't had the ability to measure previously because the old HR system didn't have those categories to record. We also need to make sure that we continue our campaign to uh, improve the quality of the data, so increase the number of staff who actually update their personal information so that the, the data is reliable. Thanks. I've got Lewis and Darren. Thanks. Just on that one, the profile then, is that being broken down by departments, because whilst it's great to compare and put a profile of council staff we have, you're not comparing apples for apples. If you're comparing male and female salaries, we, rightly or wrongly, we do have a lot of male-dominated jobs and we do have a lot of female-dominated jobs, and they're going to have different pay scales just by definition, so there's always going to be a pay divide in there. 
However, if we're not breaking it down by departments, the still the information is going to be skewed. Yeah, I think just with the targeting. Again, I completely agree that the council should be open to employment for everybody. But at, with regard, the bit that worried me was when you said we were going to start recording information on people's applications. The job should be given to the best person, not the person that ticks the most boxes on a profile. That, that's absolutely what would happen. But what we want to do is to make sure that when we got people applying, we can make sure that shortlists are reasonably reflective of, of uh, or not completely out of kilter with the, with, with the community we're trying to represent. But, but absolutely, every single job will only ever go to the person who's best able to, to fulfill that, that role. Natasha, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So any any data for applications and recruitment is at aggregate level. So it's not it's not an analysis of individual applicants. It's to understand the profile of who is applying. So how many men are applying? How many women are applying? What types of jobs are being applied for? What's the what the um, the disability status is, sexual orientation, and that sort of thing, so we can understand the profile rather than the individual applicants. That enables us to then take any actions we need to to maybe target recruitment activity to a more diverse community. So, for example, if we're only ever getting applications from white women, there, there's actually a more diverse range of the community that we could be targeting to apply for jobs who will be uh, could be equally good at the job, but we don't know because they haven't applied. If that makes sense. And we need to look at the things that then stop that, that happening. Yeah. Okay, Darren. Um, thank you. Just just a few observations across a couple of reports. Uh, again, on the workforce profile, um, it, it it's it's not clear to me whether the the gender pay gap that exists is because a disproportionate number of men are in more senior positions and a disproportionate number of women are in more junior positions. There is some indication that is the case within the report. I think that's one of the things we need to tease out, because if that's one of the main drivers of the gender pay gap, which does exist in the authority, then that actually defies what Lewis has, Lewis has just been saying, actually, um, in that it's, it's skewed towards... Now, there may be good reasons for that, but it's skewed towards... That's the first thing. Secondly, um, only 3% um, of uh, our employees across the 2020-2021 workforce profile have... I assume you're talking about physical disabilities. You just talk about a disability. So I assume they have physical disabilities. Again, it would be interesting to know why. Are there any particular barriers? And can those barriers be overcome? The third thing for me, <coughs> again, the workforce profile, is retention. Um, our, in in the, 29, the 2020 report says in 2019, essentially, you're left within six months or you stayed. Um, that isn't clear in the 2021 workforce profile. There is not that level of, of detail and granular detail. And I think, again, we need to tease that out. Because, again, if we're a workforce whereby you're here, you're here three months or you're 20 years, then we need to, again, we need to, to work that through. Um, those are my comments about the workforce profile. In the final report, which is the, the connectivity report, and, and, and I'm delighted that's actually coming because that's actually a crucial part of things. You say that there's a maximum capacity, I, I assume you mentioned the civic offices, of 500 people. I assume that is based upon a series of social distancing and other assessments that have been done. It will be hugely helpful to know either here or at Chris's meeting or at both um, as to what the current maximum capacity could be. Is that more? Is that less? Because then that has a series of knock-on impacts for all groups when looking at the strategic future of, of our assets. Is it still 500 people? It's still 500 people. It's still 500 people at the moment based on the current risk assessment. So the work right. that we're undertaking is to look at how we can potentially increase that. So with the relaxation of, of restrictions that the government has introduced over a period of time, the four stages, that's still the same as it was when we were in stage one? Uh, yes, and that's, that's taking a, a risk assessed view, um, focusing on business continuity, so enabling... Um, so what, what does that actually mean? Sorry, I'm so, so it, it, It's basically keeping as many measures in place, and you'll have heard the Director of Public Health referring to the Swiss cheese approach, which well, is... there's lots of holes in it. <laughs> um, so what it refers to is a number of measures, all in combination, right. giving the biggest protection, um, and 
and the approach that we've taken is having as much as many measures in place as we can to enable us as an organization to prevent outbreaks taking place in the workforce so we can continue to deliver the, the services that our residents rely on. What we can't afford is to have workplace outbreaks if we have lots of people in the office and are not able to apply as many measures as we can to protect staff and consequently residents. I mention that because in the sickness absence, obviously, as Janetta said, coronavirus is significant anyway. So there's a question as to whether that's actually working or not, um, which I think would be interesting. But I think that they're, they're, they're would need to be in that, in my mind, there needs to be a look at to see actually how many people we can really cope with now, as opposed to this 500 figure which hasn't changed since stage one of the government's four stage relaxation program, yeah. uh, which interests me. Okay. Those are my comments, Gerald. So I think, bye bye, Andy, thank you very much. So we had a report with us with Gold or feedback at Gold um, this morning um, about schools where the kids are being sent home from schools by class not because of the, the outbreaks in schools in, with kids but because the number of staff going, going off with COVID means that they just don't have the staff to be able to teach the kids in, in classrooms and so they're having to be sent back to be taught remotely um, and I think it's important that we don't get to the same the same sorts of things where because the number of people who've caught COVID mean we're unable to deliver the services that, that we need to deliver. So it's sensible to remain cautious and with uh, and to make sure that we're doing what we can to make sure there aren't too many workplace outbreaks of COVID. We all know, well I seem to know more and more people who are catching it at the moment. So I think we, we have to be careful. Um, so the other thing I thought, Natasha, was um, at some point it would be useful to have a report that looks at learning from how things have been while people have been working in a different way. Because it will be very clear that in some areas that's been very difficult and actually getting people back into the office is absolutely essential. But in other places, it seems to have worked, allowing people to work from home has worked remarkably well. Uh, and in some places, I suppose it'll be a mixture, but, but it'll be very different in each bit of the organisation. And some of the learning that we need from that would be quite useful to see. Um, because it's, it's clear that people working from home are still working in some way, in some places my understanding of the feedback is that their productivity is significantly higher. Um, for others it's just not possible. For me I, I, I regret working from home means that I'm closer to the fridge um, which is a, a problem. Um, but, but I think there is some learning that we, we, need, we need to do. Um, so a report at some point would be useful. Yeah, we, we can um, absolutely do that and that's one of the things that, that is um, actually at the cornerstone of the work that we're currently doing. Um, we have done extensive engagement with staff and I think you're absolutely right that for some teams it's worked very well, for others it hasn't worked at all and there's something somewhere in the middle. I think the, 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 there's a recognition that we have a very wide, diverse range of services that we deliver and some activities of necessity have to take place from, mm. from a council building mm. because of the nature of the service being delivered. Um, whereas there are others where actually there's a significant benefit from having the quiet time because of the activity that, that is involved in that particular job. So there is a mixture, which is why we're doing this work to see what, what are the tasks that people do need to do as part of their job that can be done in different types of settings. But I think to, to bring this also back in terms of the context of the equality and diversity agenda, we also need to be mindful that for some staff, their mental health has suffered from working yeah. at home um, and they really benefit from the collaboration opportunities and, and the social aspects of work with colleagues. So there will be a very likely scenario that um, going forward there will be an increased yep. amount of working from home because the nature of the job means that there's greater productivity from doing that 
mixed with periods of time in the office um, and certainly that's what the staff engagement yep. is suggesting would be would be effective going forward so the work that's described in that paper is around making sure we've got the tools and resources mm -hmm. to enable that to happen effectively and not impact on productivity yep. or the delivery of, of services to residents yep. so. Cal. Thanks, Chair. So, sorry, can you confirm which reports are actually Well, I think we're doing all, we're did, we're so all, so all the three. Because they're okay. just here for information. There's no decisions to be made, Cal. Okay. Um, the final report, I would mm. like, if possible, more of a formal kind of presentation to us okay. on that, seeing as it's been presented to us, rather than it just being taken as read. I think there's a, a fair bit in there that is of okay. public interest and significance. Um, but I'll, I'll come, down, come back to that. Firstly, in terms of the workforce profile, um, I think this is a really important bit of work, and um, thank you very much for bringing it forward. Obviously, until we start to drill down into, into these figures and statistics, then we can't understand what the issues are, um, and then kind of plan how to address them. There's, I think there's a, a few interesting um, different parts of this, but in particular, I found of interest the report on page 77, which refers to the PCC pay bands um, and the numbers of people within those bands who identify as um, from a minority ethnic group. And if you look at, I mean, it's obviously a relatively low percentage across the board compared to the communities that we represent, as people have mentioned. But particularly if you look at the, the high bands, um, so the, the senior leadership parts of the council, so I'm looking at bands kind of 15 and above, my math says there's 52 roles there um, and one person from a BAME background, which was 0.5% or a bit less than 0.5%, um, which is clearly a significantly amount less than Portsmouth as a whole. Um, and constituencies like mine would probably double that, kind of 20% plus from BAME backgrounds. Um, there's clearly work to be done. Um, but as I say, I think we're, we're making progress in identifying perhaps what the issues are um, and then we can kind of hopefully move forward to try and ensure that every part of the council and every band within the council is as representative um, of the city as a whole as it could be. I, I think before I ask my question on the last report, it might be helpful. I know Natasha did start to do it, but just to give a kind of presentation on its, its contents and a summary, if that's okay. Okay, do you want to do a couple of lines on the... On the connectivity report yeah absolutely fine so um, th this is a piece of work that um, started with a much smaller scope before the pandemic and was, was very largely around modernizing the technology that we use um, since the pandemic and the move to um, uh, to have a need for more safe working practices for both residents and staff um, and the wide use of different technology that obviously the work has now expanded to the creation of a COVID safe workplace. So the program has now um, been started and what it's looking at specifically um, in the first phase is changes to the civic office. Uh, one of the things that has happened as a result of people moving to work from home during the pandemic is um, DSE risk assessments, dis display screen equipment risk assessments where people are working from home, which have resulted in the requirement for people to take home things like office chairs, uh, larger screens and monitors, and we, we have enabled staff to take that from the office. As a consequence, what we've got left in the office is not quite fit for purpose for when staff come back. So what we are seeking to do and what the funding is going to support is a standardized desk setup so that when people come back to the office, they can literally plug and play. They can, they can plug in, sit down anywhere. There's a docking station that will work rather than having to search around the offices to find a desk that's got the right kit um, for them to use to enable them to keep some of the kit at home. Um, a resource booking system so that people are able to book into a space to work when they decide to come into the office um, so that we can manage uh, the capacity in the building and now that capacity down to your point earlier 500 at the moment but would look this would have what is it going to enable us to look to increase that capacity over time because we'll have better knowledge and data of where we've got space but also the patterns of the different teams of when they're coming in and where they're occupying space and then um, the final thing is around hybrid meeting room um, kit as well because 
if we do have a scenario where some staff are in the office and some staff are working from home, it's not always conducive because of the nature of the work or the setting for hybrid meetings to take place in an open plan environment. Some meetings need to be done in a confidential way. So it means that people can continue to have meetings and that might be with colleagues, it might be with partners. So we have found through the pandemic engaging with partners has actually proved to be very effective and in fact more effective than it was before the pandemic where we're able to meet on a virtual basis because there isn't the travel time and requirements around that to meet face to face. So having the hybrid meeting capability um, again is something that staff of feedback would be a significant benefit to ways of working going forward. That's all complemented with some of the work underway from a technology point of view that was already underway pre-pandemic but is supported by some of that technology. Um, and, and of course, to complement that, we are looking at some of our HR policies and procedures because some of those need to be adapted and changed. And we're also rolling out training for, as I mentioned earlier, for our staff and our managers on how to more effectively work and manage in, in a remote way. So the funding that's been assigned to this um, has been assigned from the uh, Contain Outbreak Management Fund because it is all focused on uh, creating a COVID safe workplace. Um, and that is one of the criteria for that fund. I believe the um, spend from that particular grant is reported or is planned to be reported to the local outbreak engagement board. Um, as a fund, it is, it is supported um, a number of different initiatives for COVID safety in the city and among other partners. So, so we are one beneficiary from that fund in terms of this work going forward. Ideally, what we would like is to be able to roll out the work that we're currently doing to the wider estates beyond the civic office, um, but there isn't any funding identified for that yet. And we do deliver services from a range of other settings, not just the civic office, um, and a capital bid is being put forward to, um, to, as an expression of interest for any further work that we could do as part of a phase two to roll this out more widely. So that's a, a summary, I hope. <laughs> Chair. Thank you, Chair. I mean, thank you for um, that report. Obviously, this is an important bit of work, and I think we could probably all recognise that actually ways of working are going to change at the back of the pandemic, and it's right that the Council should adapt to that and start to plan for that change. Um, I am particularly interested in the amount of funding that's been allocated to this project, and specifically the process by which that funding has been allocated. Um, but obviously, this is the first time we've ever seen this figure kind of reported. £1.3 million is a lot of money. Um, and ordinarily, I think there would be a different process that, that would be followed, one that would be more transparent um, and kind of where a formal decision would be taken to a public meeting for that amount of money. It's my understanding of how the council works. Now, I appreciate over COVID, some of those processes had to, by necessity, be streamlined. We couldn't organise a council meeting to go and buy PPE, for example. So where there was an urgent or emergency need, I, I appreciate that being the case. But for stuff like this, which I, I can't see as being quite so urgent, um, I, I guess I'm just asking the question of whether this was a proper use of that process or whether there should have been um, kind of wider discussion and kind of public engagement within allocating such a substantial um, amount of money to a project. Natasha, do you want to walk us through the process? Very happy to. Um, the, the, the funding is, a, is not council funds. It is a grant from the Department of Health and Social Care, um, and it is specifically geared towards um, the COVID outbreak management across the city. Um, the governance around the spend of that fund um, sits with the Health Protection Board, which in turn reports into the local engagement um, local outbreak engagement board, which is a subcommittee of, I get this right now, the um, health and wellbeing board. I believe a paper is being prepared for the next local outbreak, outbreak engagement board on all of those. There's two different grants. There's the Contain Outbreak Management Fund, which this um, funding comes from, and then there's also a separate grant allocation um, and a report is going to the next local engagement um, board about that both of those funds and how the money has been allocated 
and um, how the money's been spent and what has been spent on and some governance around it. So it is not, it, it, it is, I suppose it's not a, the governance for that wouldn't sit with the Employment Committee, but the governance is being addressed through the mechanism um, of health protection uh, from a COVID management point of view as a sub subcommittee of the Health and Wellbeing Board. I appreciate it's perhaps out of the remit of the Employment Committee, but we've got the report before us. Just, yeah, I guess just a brief kind of comment on that. It just seems to me the process is a little bit unusual, um, and it seems like the money has been allocated, and then members or kind of the, the relevant committees are going to be told about it further down the line, and perhaps given the opportunity to comment. Um, I'm not querying the use of the money. It's probably the right thing to do. It just seems to me this is something there that there should be kind of transparency and oversight over. Yeah, Cal, who's your spokesman on communities and central services? I can't remember though, I don't have any specifics that I haven't that much. I believe it's George Fielding. Okay, um, so I'm sure George will be able to let you know. Um, but yes, this is a, a COVID grant and things have been quite different during the outbreak um, and they may continue to be different. Um, colleagues, can I ask, would it be helpful to have, I know these, these are only here for information and they're off for somebody else for decision because that's where the correct point of decision. Is it useful having things like that come to us for information as well or would you be happy just for the normal thing which is it just going to that, that one decision making, making meeting? I'm happy to be guided by colleagues. Um, well, for me, Gerald, the workforce planning um, and um, the equality and diversity should come to both. Um, obviously, um, the communities um, will make, be the decision-making body, but it's useful for employment committee to see those or both. The uh, connectivity one, well, that's a COVID one, and I sit on the board, so I would get it sort of three times near enough. So um, I... I I'm not personally sort of bothered about having that one come here, but the workforce planning, yes. Any other thoughts from people? Simon? I appreciate what Jeanette says about getting something like that three times, but that's a function of the committees and the places that you sit, and some members around here probably don't. So uh, I, I'm quite happy with them to, to, to come here so we can get a view. Um, I have to say, and this is probably on a more general thing, it's probably a number of years since I've sat on the Employment Committee. Um, and I have to say, and it's probably credit to Natasha and her team, that the reports and the breakdown of information, as much as we've been looking to add things, in that, that period of time, it, it is a completely different place with the quality of the information that's now coming to this committee that it was when I sat, which was probably seven or eight century. years ago. Yeah, well, not quite the last century, Gerald, but yes, certainly it is a significant improvement. Okay. All right, folks, I think that's the end of our agenda. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending um, and, and for the work gone into it. Um, I think we can now push the off button, James, uh, and we will no longer be streaming.